subject is comparing our thoughts with those of God. The comparing of our thoughts and God's. Obviously, our thoughts are nothing like God's. There are immense differences, tremendous differences. His thoughts are not momentary as our thoughts are. Our thoughts come one at a time for the most part, but Almighty God, the infinite, everlasting God, far beyond our comprehension, he knows everything that there is to know, all events, past, present and future, and he knows them all the time. And he knows everything consciously in any moment of time that's just beyond our capacity to grasp and understand. It's said of uh, the famous Abraham Kuyper, or rightly pronounced Kuyper, who was Prime Minister of the Netherlands sometime between 1900 and 1905, but he was primarily not a statesman, he was a theologian. He was a church minister and a theologian and the president of a theological seminary and a great man in the word of God. But it's said of him, and uh, this is reported by uh, many people, that if somebody went into his office when he was prime minister with spiritual business concerning the church of which he was president also, and uh, uh, they just stated their request or their case, and it was something quite complex. And then there was an interruption. And Abraham Kuyper had to say, excuse me, I will deal with this. And a very intricate political or uh, jurisdiction matter was dealt with. Well, having dealt with it, having dealt with the intricacies, he would immediately turn to his original questioner and say, here is the answer to your question. And something that you would expect to have been worked out at length would be stated in just a few minutes. And so it was said that he could think of at least two things at the same time and multitask in that way. Whether that's so or not, I don't know. But uh, I never heard of anyone who could deal with three things at the same time or four, let alone five or six. And yet God is able to deal with millions of things at the same time. Never forget, he sees everyone, he knows our every thought. He knows it at the same time as knowing every thought that has ever been thought by any human being and ever will be. That is certainly beyond our capacity to grasp. So his thoughts are nothing like our thoughts, even in that simple sense. God is aware of all things. His plans, his thoughts, his responses are above and beyond all time. He thinks of us all constantly. And if you're in his love, his love and affection, along with love and affection for everyone else, whom he saves, who he brings to himself, is constant and everlasting. So God's thoughts are nothing like our thoughts. They are, of course, infallible thoughts. Right now, there are people who are wondering who uh, uh, fired the nerve gas in among the civil population in Syria. Everybody, or at least not everybody, but most people in authority in the West thinks it was the Syrian regime. Are they, can they be sure? Can they be certain? Perhaps as there are people on both sides who are equally capable of evil things, so we read, so we're given to understand, perhaps it could have been uh, the rebel side or some very unfortunate elements among them. Well, we have so many problems we can't determine. We don't know the answer to. But God has none. God's every thought is absolutely perfect, correct, and accurate. Again, that's beyond our comprehension. He makes no mistakes, ever. We're thinking of the living God. These are profound words. My thoughts, says the Lord, 
are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. His intelligence is infinite and infallible. Thoughts. What would God's thoughts consist of? Reflections, but not like ours in time. Eternal reflections. Delights. God takes pleasure in things. Eternal delights. Plans. We say casually, God made all his plans in eternity past, but there's no past, present, or future with God. He is outside time, so all his plans are instant and yet eternal. There's no concept of time attached to them. All his reactions, God's reactions, well, yes, even to our human acts and circumstances. But with God reacting to human events, well, it, it, it makes you think of a giant chessboard in which the player on one side is such a genius that he knows every conceivable move and the correct response, umpteen possibilities in advance, infinite possibilities in advance. And that is God. He knows the correct response to every single thing that could or may happen and exactly what he will do. He has judicial decrees that he makes and judgments and all is conducted in the context of eternity. His will, his thoughts will prevail over ours always. Look at verse 9 here. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The heavens, the skies, the stars, unreachable by us and mysterious, so much higher than our thoughts in quality, in mechanics, are God's thoughts over ours. God's thoughts are so different from ours. God's thoughts are outward thoughts, flowing out thoughts of benefit or perhaps of judgment if this is necessary. Our thoughts are all towards us for my benefit. What will happen to me? How can I look good? How can I do better? How can I enrich myself? How can I enjoy myself? All my thoughts are in connection with me and us and our society and our well-being. They're all thoughts that flow to us ultimately and God's are the very opposite. He is the eternal benefactor, the one through whom all life and blessing and provision comes. God's thoughts are eternal thoughts. He blesses people not just for time, but for eternity. And for the people who love him, he works all things together for their eternal good, for their good, for those who love him, but for their eternal good. Whereas our thoughts are all material and connected with time, not spiritual and eternal like God's. All God's thoughts are saturated with kindness and benefit in some shape or form. Our thoughts are so appalling by comparison. They include thoughts of cruelty, malice, unkindness. You've only got to think of wars. Wars, violence, genocide, conflict, terrorism. Why, human history is just a, a history of it, an unending story of it. These are our thoughts since 1903, the Boer War in South Africa. Then you have World War I, and in the middle of that you've got the Russian Revolution and all the deaths and the terrors that went on. And then if you jump on to the 1920s, you've got our original conflict in Iraq. And we were back there again, as though we'd never learned the lesson of the difficulties years later, as you well know. And you come on to the Spanish Civil War, and World War II, and genocide in North Africa, and then our having to uh, 
cruelly put down terrorism in Kenya. And then you've got Suez and the great Chinese civil war and all its deaths. And the Korean war and then Egypt and Syria and Israel and Vietnam and more genocide in Africa and Cambodia and the troubles in Northern Ireland. I'm leaving so much out, I'm sure. Then uh, the Soviet experiment in Afghanistan and then Iran and Iraq. On and on it goes, and the Balkan Wars, and so, well, you can bring it up to date yourself. That's our thoughts, our thoughts, so full, so pregnant with hostility, and temper, and anger, and malice, and death, and God's thoughts by comparison. So benevolent, he must be a God of judgment, he must one day put down all sin and judge it. But he is over that, a God of mercy, a God who conceives a way of salvation. Our thoughts are constantly mistaken and having to be revised. God's thoughts are never mistaken and never have to be revised. God's thoughts in the Old Testament, those beautiful commandments, I won't speak about them or deal with them, but you look at the commandments and the second table of the law and the ideal society, and though they're expressed in negative terms and we therefore recoil from them and we think God is a hard taskmaster, every one of those commandments from the first to the last and especially the second table of the law are designed to create and construct a peaceful and happy society. They're a great blessing. They're a tremendous protection against fallen human nature. Then God's thoughts contain promises, all of them promises of salvation. Why God's thoughts? He knows and sees everything. It's like... Uh, well, you could be riding through the countryside on a bicycle and there's a hill ahead of you. You can't see what's beyond it. You're a stranger to that region. You've got a map, but that doesn't tell you an awful lot, perhaps. And you're waiting until you puff and pant and you get to the top of the hill and then you'll see the valley. But there's another hill further on and you won't see what's beyond that. And you're cycling along seemingly at a snail's pace and you're just getting a valley at a time, or a field at a time, or amidst the trees just seeing a little bit here and there. How much better if you could clamber into a helicopter, and up it goes. It's not intimidated by mountains or hills. It can get high enough to see everything. It can stop, be stationary in the sky, so that you can have a good look round. It can move in any direction at will. What a difference. It's a feeble illustration, but this is just a shot at comparing man's thoughts and God's thoughts. God has a better perspective. God has the total view of all history, let alone all geography. God can see everything at the same time. Of course, his thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. The Hebrew word translated thoughts literally means to plait, to weave, or to plait. It's a good word for thoughts, because that's what thoughts are. They're ideas and reflections and hopes and schemes and plans, sometimes being interwoven. The thoughts in your life, God's thoughts, so much more complex, so much more wonderful than our thoughts. God has, for example, an end point in his thinking as far as the world is concerned and the human race. He's got an objective. His thinking is leading to a point where the world will end, the day of judgment will come, and a multitude of people whom no man can count, who were drawn from every land and nation, every day and age, will be transformed into perfection and elevated into the eternal glorious kingdom. God's end point is wonderful, is blessing, 
self, ultimate salvation. God is working to that in the world, calling out a people from every generation. So superior to our thoughts. What are our thoughts? What's the goal of society? What's the policy? What's the government's policy, any government of any party? Does it have an end point? Dare any government on earth say, here we will reach perfection. We have a five-year, 10-year, 20-year, 50-year plan and society will be perfect and everybody will be happy. Well, of course, that's nonsense to suggest that human beings can do that. No human being dare have an end point, a grand objective, anything. We just stumble along from year to year, from decade to decade. We don't know what's coming, what new problems, what disasters, which we've probably sown ourselves, but we won't see it coming. We don't know, we're just coping with the present. We're like somebody driving along the road or maybe driving a horse and cart and the horse has gone out of control and you don't know where it's going next. You can only just about keep it from going over the edge into a ditch or something. And that's the human race. How much higher are God's thoughts? There's a grand objective. There's an end point and it's wonderful, but we have no such objective. Why don't you try asking the atheists, where are we going? They haven't any idea. In fact, they're very annoyed that you asked the question. Don't be ridiculous. We're not in control of this ship or this vehicle. We're just holding on. And that's how it has to be. God's thoughts are so much higher, so much more productive than our thoughts. All his thoughts are true to his attributes. And his thoughts are these. Redemption. How to save a lost human race how to restore men and women, how to bring them back because they've disobeyed and fallen, how to bring them back into communion with himself, how to transform their natures and give them happiness and peace and an eternal future. These are God's thoughts. Are they not higher than our thoughts? Our thoughts are how to put bread on the table tomorrow, how to make the home better, how to look good for a few days until those garments wear out, how to enjoy ourselves for a few minutes at a time. They're small thoughts, earthly, physical thoughts. We think we're clever, we're great people, we're wonderful, because we think this and we think that, but all our thoughts are just bumping along the surface of the ground by comparison with God's how to lift them up, how to give them new life, how to bring ransom to them and forgiveness and pardon. How can a holy God pardon and forgive rebellious sinners? And God's thoughts are these. In his eternal counsel, he will come himself. A member of the triune Godhead will enter into time and come and be our saviour and suffer and die on Calvary's cross and bear in his own body on that cross, on that tree, the full eternal punishment that we deserve to pay for our sins and our offense, offenses against God. Those are the thoughts of God. How kind that, can there be anything to be compared with that, that God will pay for us and save us freely. We cannot earn salvation. We cannot correct ourselves. God will do it for us freely. Does any human being think like that? If you ask anybody anywhere in the world, if there is a God in heaven, how do you think you can find him and know him and, and get his favor? Oh, well, we must try and live better lives. If there is a God, we must earn it. We must deserve it. That's human thinking. God's thinking is they can't we will contrive to give it to them freely in mercy and in kindness. And all they have to do is to turn and repent and believe in what Christ the Lord, who created the world and every human being, has done for their souls in his amazing kindness and at his own cost. Dear friends, those are God's thoughts, so different from ours, so our thoughts are time-bound, material-bound, self-bound, 
impure, greedy, unfair. Look at this ninth verse. Well, even verse 8, we haven't finished. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Ways. The word translated ways, well, it's a perfectly good translation. Perhaps it would be clear to us if I tell you it's roads, trodden paths. That's the Hebrew. Neither are your roads and paths my roads and paths. In other words, your lifestyle, the direction you take in life is not God's. God's way is what's God's way? God's way to save fallen men and women. I will send my word to them. I will give, inspire authors, the scriptures, the holy scriptures will be brought into being over time. I will raise up messengers and prophets, holy men of God with remarkable powers and prophecies that come to pass to authenticate them and to demonstrate that they are my spokesmen. And I will give and publish my word and my plans into the world. And as part of that revealed scripture, there'll be all the predictions and promises of a savior. For centuries ahead of his coming, he will be promised with more and more details of how he would save men and women and how he would live and how his divine power and being would be demonstrated. And then he'll be incarnate in the world. He'll enter into human flesh as a child. And this will be so widely published and all the world will know. And then having lived a perfect and an unblemished life and having performed thousands of compassionate healing miracles to demonstrate his divinity and his power, he will allow himself in apparent weakness to be arrested and crucified and slain. And there on Calvary's cross in accordance with the scripture, God the Father will pour out upon him all the punishment of those who would ever be saved and reconciled with him in the history of the world. That's God's plan. That's God's thinking. Benevolence, kindness, mercy. Benevolence, kindness, mercy and grace all the way through. How different from ours, dear friends. Man's ways, get rid of God. Get rid of him. We don't want him. They say he's benevolent and merciful and ready to figure. Doesn't matter, get rid of him. We hate him. We want to be captain of our own ship, master of our own fate. We want liberty to sin. We don't want this business of repenting to God and asking for forgiveness and receiving new life and moral values and moral strengths and walking with him. We want to determine all our own affairs and live for our pride and do as we like and indulge ourselves as we will. Those are man's thoughts. How different, how base by comparison, how low, and yet where do our thoughts get us? Here we are, century after century, same problems, same calamities, same difficulties, same miseries, unhappinesses. Oh, dear friends, but God's thoughts, are they proved? Yes, countless people come to Jesus Christ, repent of their sin, and find him to be their savior. And they come to know him and walk with him and prove him and they love him and they wouldn't part with him. Oh, dear friends, he changes their nature and their conduct and their lifestyle. Makes shallow people profound people. Mean people, generous people. Cruel people, kind people. God's thoughts are proven thoughts. God's policy is perfect. His way of salvation is certain and true. The benevolent thoughts of God. Let me just move to conclusion by showing you some of the other verses here. Look at uh, verse 10. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, 
that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Oh, God's thoughts are benevolent. He changes us. Look, he makes your life fruitful. It's like the rain and the snow coming down and watering the earth. And then the earth in due time comes to life and things grow and there is ample provision and beauty. Well, it's like that with conversion. We repent of our sins, we yield to Christ and he changes our lives and what is produced is the fragrance of a new life. We, this is exactly the illustration that runs on. Verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. These are wonderful words, inspired words from the poet prophet Isaiah. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hand. Why, in your view, in your outlook, in your estimation of life around you, everything will change, said the hymn writer. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen because now you're possessed with happiness. You have a hold on divine resources. You know your Christ and you walk with him. He gives you a task and a purpose in life to fulfill for him. And everything is so different. The miserable person has become a happy person. The person who had no purpose and no objective has become a servant of the Lord. These are such beautiful words. Verse 13, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Life is like a new land. Even the crops and the trees and the hedgerows are better and different. Streams and lakes and scented berries. That's the picture of verse 13. Because you're a happy person and a fulfilled person. And you have new virtues. You have integrity and greater purity and kindness and discernment and unselfishness and humility. And these things will be formed in you because Christ is at work in you. Oh, dear friends, let me just go back to verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. As we come to conclusion, I do want you to note that this seventh verse emphasizes repentance of all sin in coming to Christ, in coming to God. That's the key thing. You must believe in Christ. He is the only way of salvation. You cannot secure the blessings of God yourself. Once you're his child, you will be expected with his help to improve your life and to go forward in the walk of righteousness. But there's nothing you can do to get yourself forgiven or saved except to trust in what Christ has done for you. But in order to come to him, you must not only trust him, but repent of your sin. And that's why repentance is so emphasized in this seventh verse. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Do you know how to ask for forgiveness? Scan your life. Ask for the help of God. Scan your life and acknowledge your major sins. 
You can't possibly make an inventory of them, a list of them. It would take you 10 years to repent. But you know the worst about yourself. You know your temper. You know you tell lies. You know pride dominates so much of what you do and how you think. You know your cruelties if you have them. You know your major sins. Oh, pray to God to make you ashamed and go before him and own them to him and tell him you want to leave them behind and tell him you long for the pardon of Christ, the pardon which he's purchased by dying for sinners like you on Calvary's cross and mean it with all your heart. And I close with just the opening verse of the chapter. God's appeal to you. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. It's like coming for water when you're desperately thirsty and dying. And he that hath no money, God will give you forgiveness freely. Come ye, buy and eat. Ye come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Incline your ear, verse 3, and come unto me here and your soul shall live that's our need god's thoughts are not our thoughts thoughts of forgiveness thoughts of new life thoughts of kindness thoughts of changing us and taking us one day to eternal glory god's thoughts are not like our thoughts reject them Reject the thinking of God, the thoughts of God, the appeal of God, and God's only alternative, may we put it in human terms, is to judge you and condemn you, to bring you under his righteous indignation. So come, listen to God appealing to you. Come, hear it, and go on your knees and ask him to forgive you and change you and make you his child, and be your God. And if you mean it, he will from this day forward. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, deal with us, we pray. And even as that inner rebellious self seeks to despise and throw off these tender appeals, Oh, Lord, command our hearts. Take hold of us, melt us down, and cause us to repent and to come to Christ and to see his glorious love. Oh, Lord, bless each one in this congregation, we ask, in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.